Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 105. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And welcome to the show where every week we talk about classic systems that you might have grown up with back in the day. You know, whether it was a Mega Drive or Super Nintendo or used to run home and load up games on your Commodore 64 cassette deck. Or your Specky, there was loads of them, weren't there? So many systems to cover. And actually, speaking of which, on this week's show, we're kind of talking about a system that doesn't really get a lot of love from retro gamers this side of the pond. No, because we've talked to a lot of American developers, and a lot of American developers have done Apple II stuff, they've done Macintosh stuff. We really didn't have anybody doing that in the UK. I don't remember seeing many Macs around, do you? I think the first Mac I saw, it was summer holidays when I was about seven years old. And my auntie owned like a print shop in Shrewsbury. Mm. And I went in there and she had like these, you know, little computers that were all like all in ones and like a mouse. I was like, <laughs> and I remember drawing my name in like the paint program and, and like printing it out. white and stylish. <laughs> but I had like a Commodore at home and that was color graphics and the Mac was black and white. So yeah. in some ways it seemed a bit less advanced, but the mouse and stuff was pretty cool. But like you said, they had such a big scene in America. And not so much over here in the UK, which is why I guess this week was actually quite unique. Yeah, little did we know there was a little Mac scene going on on the Isle of Wight yeah. in the UK. <laughs> uh, and this is Patrick Buckland, who uh, is a co-founder of Stainless Games, and he's done some great titles for the Mac. Uh, Crystal Quest was one, and, you know, he's also done, oh, Carmageddon. Massive series, obviously. And even going back to, like, you know, the Apple II, um, he did some early games on there when he's about, you know, 17 years old. One of them was called Liberator. That is kind of a bit of an infamous story now because he worked with EMI, who I didn't even realise did games. No, yeah, that's really odd that they had a division, but it was so early on, wasn't it? Yeah, but they actually burnt the entire stash <laughs> of one of his games before it even went on sale. So he's got some really interesting stories to tell. I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Patrick Buckland is going to be our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 25 minutes from now. And speaking of special guests, we've got quite a few of them coming up, haven't we? At a, a rather big event happening in Blackpool next month. Oh, yeah, Play Blackpool, the place of cheap pints and good games. <laughs> now, for people that may not have been to Play Expo before, what's kind of the draw for you? The draw for me is kind of the stores, actually. Like... I, I would say, oh, the fabulous talks by the Retro Hour podcast. <laughs> Obviously, that's number one. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but the stores as well, because there's so much good stuff there. Like, I, I'm probably going to spend a lot of money. Like, every time I go to these events, it's really bad because I get a big dent in my pocket because I'm going around going, oh, look at that rare piece. Or, or some of the stuff that's made by people. So they have, like, this bead art stuff where they're making pixel versions and stuff. And they've got, they were selling cells from um, cartoons. Yeah last time and you could get individual cells from cartoons and like frame them and stuff and it's weapons there's absolutely <laughs> everything there but yeah i mean i love the trading areas and i think last year you know i picked up a, a sega 32x mm. um and i got we, we both got these didn't we these little cases for the raspberry pi yeah yeah they're these kind of like mini mini pie cases and they've done them in all the different themes i think you can get like a little st1 and an amiga one commodore 64 one yeah, i think yeah. i got so, i got a vic 20 one as well well they are the great and obviously lots of games as well i mean there's always a big console retailers are there um and often the prices you find are a lot better than ebay too yeah and like i i would say the arcades and a lot of people say the arcades but we never get a chance because Every time we go to the arcades, it's always at the peak time. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like <laughs> queues of 20 to 15 people. But I also love, I mean, there is always at play a nice big area full of like classic consoles and computers as well. Yeah. You know, you're playing on Vextrex and stuff like that. Oh, totally. But also, now that we've gone for quite a few years, it's just seeing everyone. Yeah. You know, bumping into the regular faces, seeing, you know, Sean Holly with all the arcades and seeing all the other guys around there. It's just fantastic. Well, we're going to be doing, obviously, the talks area again, um, and we're actually going to have um, a guy who's going to be on our show in the next week or two, uh, Steve Hammond from DMA Design. He's actually coming on the podcast. We are not worthy. Oh, oh my, my God, God yeah. We're, we're talking games like, obviously, Lemmings, Hired Guns. Uh, Lemmings too, dude, Lemmings too. Uh, Shadow of the Beast. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, actually, Steve is going to be our guest on the show in the next week or two, but then we're going to be doing a live panel with him and maybe a few other members from uh, that kind of era as well. Yeah, yeah, we've got some um, exciting spectrum uh, people that may be coming as well. Well, the Oliver Twins are going to be there too. Obviously, they're okay. doing a game um, for the Spectrum, a new Dizzy game for the Spectrum next. That I've heard might be getting you know might have a little chance to play that if you're coming down. Um, we're also going to have our massive YouTuber panel as well. Now these are all people that we've had on the Retro Hour podcast before: Guru Larry, 
Uh, Kim Justice, Slopes Game Room, who was on last week. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, he's going to be that nostalgia nerd. Peter Lee, really, you know, amazing YouTube channels. We kind of cherry picked our favourite YouTubers from the UK to come along to this, didn't we? I think they're the best. Yeah. <laughs> in, our, in our opinion. Yeah. And when we've had them all on the show, I mean, they're all such interesting people to talk to. And I'm sure if you're into retro gaming like we are, you'll probably watch their channels anyway. So it's a chance to come down, enjoy a panel, see them live, get to meet them, buy them a drink at the bar. I think so. I've spent about a week watching Slopes Kickstarter videos <laughs> recently. You got hooked. <laughs> <I> got <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the bug. So tickets are on sale now. It happens uh, next month on the 10th and 11th of February uh, over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, both days. We'll be there for the entire weekend. And actually, if you'd like to come along and be our very special guests, we do have a little competition running on our website right now. Now, we decided to keep it easy, didn't we? No question. No, no, just go to theretrohour.com forward slash win, play, expo, Blackpool tickets. Uh, you'll probably be able to find it on the front page. <laughs> yeah, it's got a few hyphens in there. I think you yeah. the direct URL. That's very old school, Ravi, reading out the... Uh, URL the, slug, yeah. 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 <laughs> HTTP, go <Yeah>. along. <laughs> but yeah, we have got a little competition running on there. Uh, it's open for a couple of weeks. All you got to do is fill in your details on the form there. Uh, we'll pick out a couple of people at random and you'll win free weekend passes to come along, you and a mate, and enjoy the entire weekend in Blackpool. And there's loads going on as well. I mean, after the show, we always end up going out, don't we? Nice restaurant, few drinks. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, restaurant, but, well, restaurant. that's the thing. I think this year as well, because it's in the middle of winter, the hotel's just going to be all of us retro people. Yeah. So let's party at the hotel. Let's, <laughs> let's take over the bar. I great. heard there's room for like 25 quid at the actual at the venue. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You can get a really good price, actually, yeah. with breakfast included. And then we always end up going to that little cafe, don't we, for breakfast the next day? Yeah, we've, we, we've got a little local greasy spoon. Yeah. <laughs> I did the nicest omelette, though. Yeah, I think it was yeah, about, yeah. about £3, I think, and a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to come along, do check out that competition on the front page of our website, theretrohour.com. While you're on our website as well, if you'd like to give a little something back, you know, we always do appreciate this. You know, we, we put this show out week in, week out for over two years now. Yeah. We don't ask for anything for it. If you want to just listen, you know, it's completely fine by us. If, though, you'd like to support the show, I mean, it is always nice if we don't have to pay for the entire thing out of our own pockets. Let's just go to events and stuff. Let's just keep doing the show, pay for all our hosting, all our subscription services we've got to do every every couple of months. So all you've got to do is nip onto our website, theretrohour.com. We have a couple of donation buttons on there that you can find any amount, completely up to you, uh, either via PayPal or cryptocurrency, if you're into that market as well. We accept all of them, I think, now. Um, we, 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 uh, we accept tokens on the Ethereum network and there you Bitcoin go. <laughs> and other stuff, yeah. <laughs> so you can find all those links on the front page of theretrohour.com. This week, thank you so much for your donations. Krista Holston. Tim Delman. Lawrence Fort. And Joe Locker. Who all made donations through our website. You can do the same and find your place in the Hall of Fame in a future episode of the Retro Hour podcast. Head on to our website, theretrohour.com. Now, plenty of news doing the rounds this week. Should we start with some Apple news, actually? Yeah, let's get into it. I, know, I, I love this old kind of Apple stuff, you know. Oh, and this is about the Lisa. Now, the Apple Lisa, that was kind of the first, was Apple's first machine with a GUI. It was, yeah. And then uh, there's, uh, there's famous scenes where uh, kind of... Steve Jobs goes, he stole it from me when he sees the first uh, Windows yeah, machine. Yeah, Bill Gates has ripped him off. But I mean, to be fair, Steve Jobs did steal it from Xerox Park. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so what goes around comes around. Um, but obviously, if you've seen the movie, Pirates of Silicon Valley, that, that scene's in, isn't it? Which yeah. is a top movie. Um, but the Lisa, I mean, technically the Lisa was a commercial failure because it cost $10,000 in 1983. Today, that'd be $24,000. Yeah, and they say Macs are expensive now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah you, you buy like a two grand MacBook Pro now, it's pennies compared to what it was back then. But obviously, this machine is kind of legendary because it was the first Apple machine with a graphical user interface. It was, you know, based on the Xerox Park technology that they saw, and it kind of did set the, the future prototype for what all GUIs will become. It's like today, you know, many of the, the systems that were introduced there. Now, apparently, um, Lisa stood for Local Integrated System Architecture. But obviously, if you watch our film, you know it's kind of, it was named after his daughter, wasn't yeah, it? That he, yeah. he denied he ever had at the time. So it's a really cool system. I mean, I've never actually seen one in person. I've never seen one in person. I know somebody with one, but um, yeah, he's probably got it under lock and key. <laughs> <laughs> that Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> well, they only sell 10,000 units of them. And it cost them $150 million to develop this system. And apparently, this is one of the reasons that Steve Jobs actually left Apple, because the new CEO came in, John Scully from Pepsi, mm -hmm. and basically Jobs wanted to keep the Lisa project going, but it wasn't making money, so they had that big fallout and he left. Yeah, it was like a kind of passion project, wasn't it, for Steve? Yeah, and, yeah that and, and John Scully was like, this is realistic, and then... 
the Mac came out and yeah. Yeah, Jobs went off in a huff and started next, you yeah. know, shortly after that. So legendary machine. And what's quite interesting is, even though it's been 35 years now, Apple have decided they're going to release the source code um, with the Computer History Museum. They're going to release the Apple Lisa OS for free as kind of an open source project. Oh, cool. That's really cool because that's, yeah, going back to the Xerox Park stuff and you could probably do a side-by-side -side comparison, couldn't you? Well, that's it. even for someone who you maybe might not be a developer or anything like that, which I'm not, you know, but I can I kind of look through code and, you know, especially if it's well commented, mm. you can see what's going on. Um, you've got, you know, more programming experience than I have. But I think looking back at this early source code for the first commercial graphical user interface, it's got to be some really interesting stuff in there. Oh, totally, yeah. If, if, if you're a real code monkey, you can get in there and uh, do some crazy stuff, I can imagine. Yeah, or even maybe, you know, people could develop new Lisa stuff using this source code. So it might be interesting. And there is actually um, an or official... Even update the OS. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, brand new version that you can run on, like <laughs> your, your, your Touch Bar MacBook Pro, yeah. <laughs> well, this was announced. There's actually a list called the Lisa List, which is like for Apple Lisa enthusiasts. Um, like a mailing list, they announced it on there, and uh, that's going to be coming out very soon by the looks of it. So uh, we'll put a link to that in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Slightly nerdy, but very cool, I think. Oh, very cool, yeah. Obviously, it was CES, wasn't it, last week? Well, this is interesting because I've not really heard many people at CES talk about retro things, but this year seems to be a big change. Now, I was, yeah. I'm a big listener to Leo Laporte's podcast, uh, The Tech Guy, yeah. And he turned around and he said, CES, they had this Game Boy thing. You know, it was just all old stuff. And it's like, actually, Leo, that's now popular. <laughs> the, stuff we, the one we were talking about last week. Yeah, the Hyperkin yeah, yeah. that we were talking about. Well, there's a lot of stuff that's come out at CES. Well, um, I know Retro Gamer Magazine did a little roundup, actually, of quite, you know, a lot of the stuff that was announced yeah, then. It's quite a lot. because Retro's been dominating the kind of news in it. Retro and stupid robots <laughs> yeah. falling over Oh, everywhere. God, I saw it was LG that did that demo where it ignored him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what was what, yeah, that? Was good. Oh, that's so cringe. Cringe worthy <laughs> stuff. If you want to look that up, um, but Retrobit, uh, another company, and we've covered them before. Remember, we talked about the Retrobit top loaders. Oh, the console and, they did, and the older consoles. Yeah, they've officially um, gone together with Sega now. Right. So they're officially making Sega merchandise, but they're also announcing their own little Game Boy as well, which is called the Go Retro Portable. <laughs> Another Game Boy. <laughs> Another Game Boy to fight the hype again. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're making um, accessories for the Dreamcast and the Saturn as well. We'll, we'll get on to that first. Sorry. This Game Boy includes LCD screen, scratch resistant, all of that, um, rechargeable lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. But guess how much it is, mate? What for this Game Boy? Yeah. Pricey? Thirty four ninety nine. Oh, wow. Okay. That's dollars as well. Yeah. So Pro the, probably thirty four ninety nine quid then. Yeah, <laughs> Normally, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's not too shabby. That's not bad at all, yeah. is it, for your machine that you can kind of play all your old school stuff in? And it's, it's not. It doesn't use carts. It uses built in games, but they're three hundred and they're officially licensed. You see, this is. Uh, and you know, someone's going to hack it the minute it comes out. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, there'll be every game on there before the end of the month. Oh, completely. But now. The other part of the Sega deal, here we go. So, that's the licensed games on their thing to fight Hyperkin. Yeah. Now, they're releasing Sega accessories. So, uh, these are for the original systems? Yeah. Yeah. Saturn controllers at the moment. Genesis controllers. All Bluetooth that work with the original system. Wow. Yeah. And they've got little adapters there. They've got Dreamcast controllers. They've got even got the rare Dreamcast um, RGB adapters so you can get true RGB signals out of the back of the Dreamcast. Because so the Dreamcast is quite well connected in terms of video, isn't it? It can do quite a lot of different... Oh, yeah, it's of... 480i it can yeah. go up to. So all these rare cables, you know, you might get your Dreamcast broadband adapter being <laughs> remade. <laughs> what is good, I mean, I'm looking at some of the pictures here and they've got the original, like, Sega Saturn branding. Yeah. On the boxes. And that's one of my favourite controllers, that is the Sega Saturn. It's so comfortable, honestly. Yeah, I like the... I've got the 3D controller for the Saturn. Have you seen that on the round one? That's good for like playing the FPSs and stuff like yeah. that. But just for the pure, like, you know, arcade games, yeah, the original pad's really good. But yeah, like you said, they've got a, a Genesis one as well, which is a Bluetooth arcade pad. And it actually does look really comfy. Yeah, and you just plug that into your original Genesis, the Bluetooth receiver, yeah. and you can play it. It's like, what? 
I love the fact that Sega have actually thought, you know, yeah, we'll give them the branding to do that. The Dreamcast one, it looks like it could have been a product that was released in like 1999. You've got the swirl on there. Even kind of the artwork and stuff looks like the original Dreamcast box. Yeah, and that's it. And it's for Sega Saturn and it's for this system. But I'm, I'm reading the small print. I've zoomed in on one of them. Yeah. And it says here on the Bluetooth arcade, it's for PC, Mac and... Oh, wow, okay. Android devices compatible with games from Sega Mega Drive. So I think maybe the Bluetooth one is just a PC thing because they might not be able to get that running. But the other stuff is all for the systems. Okay. Well, it's good for emulation, emulation, I guess, isn't it? You know, yeah, people use yeah. that. So, yeah, with a built-in blast processing as well, no doubt. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just waiting for the console, aren't we, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put that in this week's show notes. If you want to find out more, it's good that you get, you know, new stuff like that because there's one thing, I, you know, I don't mind buying second-hand systems. Mm. And if you're into, like, the retro market, You've got you've got no choice really most of the time if you want to get the originals. What I don't like is though having a controller that someone else has like had their hands on for like twenty thirty years, or, or paying ninety quid for a cable yeah. just to do something, or a mouse, or something weird like that. You know, that's just because there's a limited supply. It's so expensive. When I got I got a couple of joysticks off eBay, and the first thing I do is you know you get a wet wipe and you wipe them all down, and years they're always, of uh, oh they're always black afterwards, aren't dead they? Dead skin on there. <laughs> and you got to go through all like you know the little cracks in the casing, get all the yeah. dirt out of those. Yeah. Old toothbrush is good. Well, you know, some of them you got the little suction cups on the bottom. Yeah. And I remember kids, you know, you'd lick them and put them down the table Suck and you'd like, it. Oh. <laughs> stick it on the, yeah. 30 horrible. years of old encrusted spit on them. So, <laughs> yeah, apologies if you're listening while you're eating. So, yeah, get some new stuff out. New controllers, they're always yeah, appreciated. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, uh, antibacterial ones. <laughs> <laughs> she includes them in the box for future yeah. buyers, yeah. Uh, do you remember a game called 1942? Oh, of course. It's a classic game, 1942 is. Amazing shoot 'em up game. I always remember going to the seaside. And actually, you know, if you go to, we were talking about Play Expo before, I often see a few cabinets there. There's two, it was Capcom brought it out, didn't they? Yeah. Um, 1942, 1943, I remember. Um, really cool shoot 'em up game. Um, but now, I thought this was really cool. Um, Ami 10, who are a Tenerife based uh, Amiga YouTube channel, but they also do like software and stuff like that as well, they've actually done. A remake for the Amiga in Amos. Oh, cool. Amos, yes. I, lo- I love Amos. It's a, it was an old visual um, well, programming it was basic, language. wasn't it? Yeah, it basic. was basic, but it was done in a visual script so that people could actually understand it and uh, not have to get into the raw code themselves. Um, it's done by Francois Lina, who's a good friend of ours, actually. Yeah, well, we worked with him at Friend Software today. Yeah. And we had him on the show, actually, didn't we, not long ago, yeah, to yeah. find out a bit more about Amos and Stoss. But, I mean, it's always been, you know, not only a game that I love, but also, like I said, a language that was very accessible to kids. Uh, so I did a bit of programming on, like, the Commodore 8-bit machines. Yeah. But then when I got Amos, it was always on, like, magazine cover discs that you get them, wasn't it? But well, I well, actually every, nearly every PD game was made with either Blitz Basic or Amos, wasn't it? It was... But the thing is, I mean, a lot of people back, back in the day did used to look down a bit on Amos saying it's not that powerful. Mm. But if you look at this video, I actually think this looks like a really good shoot 'em up No, this looks like quite a good Amiga game, yeah. to be honest, you know. And it doesn't compare to the greatest Amiga one, which is, oh, God, what is Banshee, it? you Banshee, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that is just that is similar, insanely actually. good. But, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a... Bloody good effort from Amos, isn't it? Yeah, and it's got like, you know, the the scrolling looks really good. Um, The sprites are quite small in it. But actually what's really cool is, obviously, Ami Tenny does like a YouTube channel, Mm. doesn't he? Um, But he's also done like a little tutorial on how he made it as well, showing like if you want to see how he coded the game. So, And, you know, I remember Biplanes. That was the best little PDA Amos game that was. I still play that game with my brother when he comes over. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Battle on biplane. They're trying to get it fly up in the air and you go backwards. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to download that, there's actually an ADF that you can download for free. I'll put that in this week's show notes. And just while we're on the subject of like remakes of classic games, um, a game that I used to love because I'd always see it at the Seaside Arcades uh, it was a game called Phoenix. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm just looking at screenshots of this and it does bring back memories of those little kind of ones that would spiral down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd get, I mean, it was quite a simplistic game. It looks a bit like uh, Space Invaders. Well, it was early, actually, looking at that. I didn't realise it came out this early. 1980, that game was released. I mean, I probably played it in about 89, 90, you know, quite late. Yeah. Um, I think, actually, I was on holiday with my family in Spain. We went on holiday, and there was an arcade machine in the lobby of the hotel, and it was Phoenix. Ah. And I'd just go in there with my brother, and we'd, like, we'd just play it all night, because it was the only thing to do while my parents were, like, you know, sitting in a restaurant or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, like... 
it was quite an easy game to complete as well. There's only about four or five stages on it. So you get the first level where you get these like aliens come down, second one that drops some bombs and stuff on you. Then you get these birds that fly out and they come out as eggs. Then you've got to shoot them and break them up. Final level on it, you get this kind of like Those weird birds alien. Are massive as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the arcade version was huge. Um, but then you get like, yeah, the, the end level is rock hard where you get this like alien in the mothership and you've got to kind of get your bullets through and break into oh, him and kill him. It's kind of a bit like Breakout, that last bit where you've got to smash through the uh, ship. But yeah. with loads of bullets coming yeah, down yeah. at the same time. It's quite a challenging game, but it was always one of my favourite shoot 'em up games and not really a game that gets a lot of love these days. Everyone talks about like, you know, R Type and Space Invaders and all those, but and, and Gallagher. But Phoenix was actually really good. And I'm quite pleased to see there's actually been a new updated version of it released uh, that you can download and play on Windows. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, there's this website you can download it from called Lurtaste.itch. Um, they've released it for free. I think he actually he did like an announcement about this before Christmas, then released it a week later. But I always think it's cool when someone actually takes it upon themselves, because by the looks of it, it's just, it's just one guy that's done it. But obviously, it was a labour of love from somebody who loved Phoenix and thought, oh, I want to give more people a yeah, chance to play Yeah, there you it. go. You know, you, you've seen that, and you've just got your little nostalgia hit from that, and then hopefully a lot of other people will remember Phoenix and make his efforts worth it. Yeah, and if you haven't seen it before, I'll play that. Highly recommend it, and uh, if you want to download that, play it on your modern PC at work. I'll put that in the this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. I thought this is quite an interesting study that's been done by Curry's PC World, of all people. <laughs> now, this is an article on their Funstock Retro, and it essentially is talking about how retro games have showed what good staying power they've got. Now, <laughs> they're looking at kind of the top games that have been talked about on social media. It's more of an analysis of like British gamers and what their interests and like kind of hobbies and habits are and what games they buy and which games they talk about the most. And it turns out these are the top 10 games that have been talked about the most on social media in, uh, say, I think it's about the last four years of the study of this. You've got Grand Theft Auto in there, FIFA, Call of Duty, right? The modern stuff, Minecraft is in there, Overwatch. But then it's stuff like Mario Kart, Pac-Man, Tekken, Stuff like that in there. Oh, Tekken, yeah. <laughs> and they reckon, you know, out of all those games, Mario Kart and Pac-Man actually like are some of the biggest talked about games on social media. Pac-Man in particular rules Twitter. That's which... the thing, you know, they're, they're, they're icons, aren't they? And yeah. they're going to stay in people's memory forever because Pac-Man was just such a big thing. So bigger than all of this Call of Duty and all that kind of stuff. It's... What is interesting, though, is apparently looking at gamers... Weirdly, because Pac-Man was kind of designed with a female demographic in mind, but mm-hmm. if you look at social media, apparently it's a 70-30 split in favour of males talking about Pac-Man. So it's actually the blokes that really love Pac-Man. Girls are playing like different games these days, it reckons. Okay. And in terms of younger players, the game, obviously Minecraft is like number one in yeah. that demographic, yeah. but Mario Kart is actually one of the most popular. They talk about like, you know, kind of uh, pre-teen gamers. Yeah, yeah, because I, I guess Mario Kart and stuff's going to get reference to the old one and the new one and uh, with a lot of these remakes you know a lot of the titles come in but i haven't heard of a pac-man remake of you so well pac-man gets remade every other week though doesn't it pac-man's like (laughs) eternal isn't it yeah it always comes out on every plat i mean there is like a an old namco gaming set that you can get from nintendo switch and pac-man's on there obviously like two different versions of it what i think it is though i think especially with the younger end of the market it's probably parents like you know dads and their sons or daughters playing together yeah, it's always there, and you know, you don't see the same thing with kind of worms or lemmings or any of that kind of stuff, but this this adds to companies wanting to get involved with retro, more people listening to our podcast, all this kind of stuff, it's great. <laughs> well, it shows the staying power, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Now, before we get into our interview with uh, Patrick Buckland, you were a fan of GoldenEye 007? I loved GoldenEye, I used to go around my friend's Callum's house and... Uh, Killing with proximity mines after work every day. <laughs> well, after school. <laughs> well, we were playing it at, um, at Joe's house, weren't we, on the, at his Christmas party? Oh, God, disastrous. Oh. You don't want to watch that. <laughs> Always get thrashed at GoldenEye. Uh, even though the game came out, can you believe, over 20 years ago, 21 years ago that game came wow, out now, yeah. 1997. It's still got such a dedicated following, that game. Um, even in terms of, now that you can get flashcards and that kind of thing, people have done quite a lot of mods for it. And there is actually a website called Goldeneye Vault, which is a fan site for it. Mm-hmm. They've actually got a big mod section on there. Now, there's a, a guy called Super Mario Bros. One Fan. He's actually gone through the game, changed the graphics, and replaced the original Bond character with Mario and Luigi. <laughs> I'm just watching the video now. He's just going around shooting Koopa Troop. <laughs> like... <laughs> 
This is great. And I, I remember big head mode. Yeah. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. <laughs> this is like this is like big character mode on every every aspect. It's not just their head. Their arms are giant and yeah. even even look at the hand, it's it's a white glove, isn't it? Like yeah, no, it's yeah. white glove. <laughs> So I think that is genius, though. It's, it's hilarious. If you if you want to just watch the video, I'd highly recommend that. Mario and Luigi as well. You can go around with Luigi. <laughs> they all look sad on the faces, though. Look how sad Luigi looks with a gun in his head. Oh, God, they've got, they've got Donkey Kong. And it says it actually works on actual hardware as well. Yeah, we've well, got a flash card, yeah. You can wow, play them there, which yeah. is pretty amazing. I would feel really bad, though, shooting like Yoshi in the head. I don't know. It's really <laughs> don't good know. fun. If, if, you're a, if you're an anti-Nintendo guy, it could be the highlight of your week. You sicko. <laughs> so if you want to check that out, I'll put that in this week's show notes as well. Right, thank you so much for checking out episode number 105 of the Retro Hour podcast. We'll be out again next Friday from all of your favourite download sites, your favourite podcast clients, YouTube, Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, iTunes, wherever you listen. Uh, please do keep your ratings coming in as well. It always really, really helps. And you can check out uh, the competition to win some free tickets for Play Expo Blackpool on our website, theretrohour.com. Yeah, we've got some great guests coming up for you. But now we have Patrick Buckland, chairman and co-founder of Stainless Games. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome this week's very special guest. Welcome to the show, Patrick Buckland. Thank you, yes. I appreciate being asked on. Now, we're going to talk to you about, you know, legendary games like Carmageddon in just a bit. We can't wait to get those stories. But this is something that we always like to start our interviews with, just to get, you know, a little bit of background. Um, if we go right back to the beginning, where did it all start for you with computers then? What was, like, your first experience or your earliest memory? Um, first experience was using a Commodore PET at school, um, getting used to that, and then a bit of RML tree, as you said, rack mount at school. Um, then my um, my granny bought me an Apple II, so that I need, I, you know, I was um, interested in programming. So when I was um, 15, um, she bought me an Apple II, a cassette drive. That would have been um, 1978, 79, something like that. Um, so that's how I started, really, just programming in my bedroom um, on the Apple II. It must have been a, quite a pricey machine back then. It was, yeah. So I wasn't complaining when she got me it. I think, she, well, if I know perfectly well, she got me it so that um, I could be the, the flashiest boy at school. So that suited me fine. So I got the computer. So it what... took me two years to persuade her to buy me a disk drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of thing were you doing on the Apple II then at home? Um, first of all, just learning stuff. Yeah, just messing around. Modifying, striking out and modifying the games that they produced. Got to know the local computer shop um, up here. Um, they gave me a little bit of contract work, even back when I was like 16, 17, just doing some... Um, the guy's brother was a chemist, so I did a label printing program. That's my first paying work, which I paid a printer. So I got a printer for that. But quite early, I um, I actually yeah, started writing games. My very first game was Liberator, which is a, um, a game for the Apple II, which I um, submitted to an advert, I think it was in the Radio Times, uh, for Thalia My Video Programs Limited, so we're called, mm -hmm. uh, and quaintly, based in Soho. Uh, that's Thalia My been a gigantic conglomerate um, at the time, a huge, just disappeared now. They were trying to get into the video game industry. Um, I sent them off this game that I wrote over the Christmas holiday while at school, and um, they accepted it. So that was my first, my first published game. Well, you mentioned that there was a, a small computer shop there as well. Um, what was the kind of scene like on the Isle of Wight then? It, was it... There wasn't. Well, there really wasn't one at all. The, the fact that we had a computer shop at all was very unusual. That was a couple of um, guys who were uh, based in cows who were into sailing. Um, so they were supplying um, some of the sort of high-end clients and stuff. Uh, they were all Apple-based at the time. They went to PC afterwards. But even that was quite unusual. Um, the local technical college here had a, a lecturer who had a pet at home. I used to go, before I had my own computer, my mother knew him, so I used to go occasionally around to his house and play around with a Commodore pet, um, you know, just for a few hours in his home. But there was nothing else. There was no scene as such at all. It was too early for that. We were making our own. And I'm often jealous when I hear about what was happening with Whiting Act and Jobs and Silicon Valley, and that great scene that was going on there at the same time. It would have been fantastic to have been yeah, living somewhere that had that, but Britain was a bit behind. Going <laughs> <laughs> to make the most of what you've got, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You make your own scene. <laughs> well, I mean, what were the sales like of Liberator? And, um, you, you know, did it, did, were you kind of surprised at how many people were, were buying the game at first? Well, that, um, uh, yeah, that's um, quite a story now, that. So 
Um, so it was, a, uh, it was a very good game. Everyone loved it. Everyone was at uni was playing it. And uh, after my first job at uni, I contacted them and said, well, how's it going? And, you know, where's my role to check? And they said, oh, no, no, we, we, we burned them all. Uh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, look, look, we had a um, cease and desist letter from Atari to Liberator. The game was a, a reverse missile command game, a very obscure coin-op by Atari, they're doing a game called Liberator, mm. um, where you were fired missiles down onto the planet rather than the other way. Um, I didn't, never heard of it. Um, for your mind, never did a trademark search. Um, so Atari sent them a letter. Uh, just before the game actually went on sale, and so they just, they, they manufactured it. Right? Um, so they just you know, burned them all. Um, never told me. Never said, hey, I suppose you give us another build because you were a different game. So that, that was my first exposure to the video games um, industry. <laughs> which is, um, I took legal advice, and the local lawyer says, you're 17, and it's you versus Thorny and I. You know, you don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't they have just renamed it or something, though? Yeah, well, so all they had to do was to rename it. It actually burned all the copies. That must have been pretty heartbreaking, though, was it? It certainly was. Yeah, it was a good game as well. So it sort of reawakened the game some years later, 1990s, eight years later. Um, for a, uh, called Sky Shadow on the Mac, so which Mac was basically the same game, but it was eight years later. Like it was a very hardcore arcade shooter mark, and things moved on really since then. But it was a, it was a love it or hate it game, Sky Shadow on the Mac. Um, some people loved it, but you had to be, the, you know, the, had to be the right sort of person to like a game like that. Very, very hardcore, very um, unforgiving, because it was actually a 1982 arcade game. I mean, you did do a, another game for the Apple II, Submarine Commander, um, with EMI yeah. as well, didn't you? Um, how, how did that deal kind of go down then after after you got burnt with Liberator? Well, no, it was in between, you see. So, okay. so um, when they were manufacturing it, I was on um, I was on my break after Holland, after university for the first year. They gave me the contract. I paid five grand uh, for what was actually only a few weeks' work, really quite hard work. But um, over the summer holidays after my first year at uni. To port it from the um, Atari 400-800. I had to basically write it again from scratch. It was a lot of work, but um, it was fantastic money. Um, so, and even then, they didn't pay me. Um, just, you know, just big company, little guy, but I just made sure I withheld the final uh, final build from them so they had a buggy version. I wouldn't give them the final build until they paid me the five grand, which they then did, of course. <laughs> um um, but I think it was only after that that I found out that actually they um, they destroyed the, the game I actually wrote. So at least got somebody out of them. <laughs> you didn't have a very good working relationship with EMI then, it seems. <laughs> I didn't really work for them ever again. No, yeah. they disappeared anyway. They dabbled in it and then vanished. A lot of the guys there, I think, ended up in Ardenwall, actually. No, um, no, Josh Ellis actually was there at the same time as me. How much of a change was it going from the Apple II to the Mac then, in development terms? It must have been... Oh, massive, massive, really. Um, when the Mac came out, I had, um, my best friend um, was um, working for Apple um, at the time. He'd been headhunted by them. Um, so he was their um, uh, sales director at Apple UK. Uh, so I was able to get very early hardware, prototype hardware. Um, I didn't pay for a computer, actually, for, until I was probably my 30s. <laughs> so I got everything you know, supplied. Apple used to supply me with lots of hardware. So quite fun, I had some stuff that I... After two C, I I had to keep hitting under the bed uh, to the prototype unit. But back on the original Mac days, you couldn't program on the Mac. You didn't have enough memory. You had to program on Lisa. So you had to uh, cross-compile this gigantic great Lisa machine to uh, to actually write Mac games. My first Mac game, Crystal Rager, was actually written on the Lisa. I mean, even getting used to like you know using a GUI, I guess, was a big thing after you know coming from the Apple II. Yeah, and they, the, what they actually ended up doing, they retrofitted it into the Apple II. So right at the end of the Apple II, there was some GUI stuff coming in. And I was actually working, did quite a lot of prototype work at the time for Apple on the creating a proper GUI for the Apple II based on the Mac. Um, that never saw the light of day, but that was in conjunction with Apple UK. Um, there's the equivalent of Quick Draw, which is the, um, uh, the, the Mac ranging engine, if you like, for the Apple II. So I was actually retrofitting the GUI into the Apple II at the time. I like a lot of that work, it never saw the light of day. Well, in 1987, you released uh, Crystal Quest as well, and that seemed to be incredibly popular. It, it, yeah, it... that's one that really took off. So that was the Crystal Razor. I wrote Crystal Razor in two days. You know, all it really was was just to mess around, learn the um, 
learn the OS, learn the development system. It's an incredibly simple game. Um, released it to shareware, so send me a tenner and send it out. That that actually did get a lot of people playing it. Um, unfortunately, people sent me ten dollars, uh, which cost me about six pounds to convert a ten dollar check. Um, and at the time, the exchange rate meant that a ten dollar check wasn't worth six pounds, which wasn't great. Um, but one of the guys that um, did um, send me a check was Mike Green, the CEO of Ashton Green. Uh, so when I then wrote Crystal Quest as the follow-up and sent that out, I uh, sent a letter out to all the people that had paid me the $10, even though I hadn't got any money from them in, the, in reality. One of them was Mike. We said, whoa, 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 stop. Don't send this game out. I want to publish it. So that's what I did. So I actually refunded, with his help, all the people that sent their $10, even though I hadn't got any money from them. Um, <laughs> And uh, we published Crystal Quest through Cast and Green. It was the first colour game from the Mac. It was also the first game that had any real sort of editor, any sort of modability. You could mod that game. We won a CES Showcase Award for that, actually. It was very, very ahead of its time. The concept of modding um, in an easy way, plus in a, in a quite advanced way if you wanted to. And then you could publish, if you want, uh, mod files for that, which in 1987 was... Um, as I, I believe, unique. Yeah, I mean, was that on, like, bulletin boards or public domain libraries, yeah. that kind of thing? Yeah, and um, cover mounts, of course, was, um, then cover mount floppies, of course, mm. uh, were quite a bit then. But, yeah, so it was, um, yeah, bulletin board stuff. I was trying to think, I was on the dirt, I can't really remember how it got distributed, that stuff, but it de- definitely did get around, because <laughs> that's how the shareware version of Crystal Rager uh, got around, so... Yeah, it's the thing about then, though, you know, people would just, even like the playground kind of scene, wasn't it, copying this and that, that the grow, you know, pretty exponentially? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the irony is, so, um, so uh, Neil Vinding, Bobby Vinding, who I set up um, Stainless with, um, you know, after that in the 90s, um, we actually got back, uh, we were school friends, but we lost contact for like 10 years. We actually got back in contact because he'd been playing Crystal Quest or ripped off coffee of coffee it, playing it for years. He's designer, so you use Max. And he suddenly notices my name on the boot screen. And hang on, he's my mate from school, wasn't he? And he looked me up in the phone book, book and gave me a call. So, <laughs> so we actually got back together, and Stainless wouldn't have happened in a bizarre way um, if he hadn't have, um, ripped off Crystal Quest. That's crazy. <laughs> <paper for that>. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, another game that really interests me is a uh, Cyber War, which was um, kind of oh, based God, on the yeah. film The Lawnmower Man. <laughs> Don't blame me for that one. Um, <laughs> that was contract work. <laughs> yeah, was, it, was that one of the last titles you did for the Macintosh? Or? Um, no, no, Calm Den was on the Mac, Calm Den 1 and 2. But it was, it, that was the last title I did for, um, as a freelancer. So I set up doing this in 94, but it was a year to get a contract. So while we're talking to SCI about um, Calm Den and Magic uh, Fitting their sort of release schedule, um, they said, hey, we can give you some contract work. So I did that personally. Um, so that Cyber War was actually the last game I did um, as a freelancer, um, you know, outside the stainless. It was, a, they were, it was fascinating what they were trying to do with that. That was um, folks McGill and John Chasey, you know, the guys behind that. They were trying, pre-rendered graphics were you know, the new thing. So um, Jane Tanner put that filled their office up in Southampton with all these um, sort of graphics workstations and they were renting this stuff. So the graphics were well ahead of its time. But um, it, was, it was odd because it was a... Uh, it took the back of um, Trackle's Lair, games like that. Which, ironically enough, I actually had the rights to at one stage, many years ago in the 80s. So the games where they're rendering stuff and you press the button at the right time, it switches to render stream A rather than B. But you don't feel like you're playing the game. So Lawnmower Man and Cyber War looked fantastic, but fortunately it was a directional game design that, um, that um, soon shriveled. <laughs> was it kind of strange being an Apple dev on the uh, kind of other side of the pond, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We, I could not get backing for Stainless at all. So when we said Stainless, I talked to everybody from EA to I mean, every single company in the UK, all the big um, publishers, lots of developers as well. Um, and they were saying, well, who the hell are you? You know, we're not going to back you for a project. You've never done anything. And, uh, despite the fact that at that time, I had 12 years of um, a published games, a published experience, but it was 
much more so then, very, very partisan. Over here, if you're someone like me, should have had a background in the BBC Micro and the uh, Commodore, obviously, you know, Vic, all the stuff, all that sort of platform, the Specky, obviously. Because I didn't, it, was, it meant nothing at all. If I'd been in America, everyone knew who I was. In Britain, no one knew who I was. So it was very, very difficult to actually get back there. It took us a full year to get someone to sign up what became Carmageddon. I think the first Mac I saw was probably the late 80s in my auntie's print shop, but I didn't see another one until, like, you know, the late 90s. So it's like, you know, there weren't that commonplace outside of, like, kind of niche industries really for quite a while, were they, over here? That's right, yeah, it was yeah. print, basically over here at print. Uh, whereas in the States, very, very different. Um, there's a really big gaming scene in the States. You yeah, know, over here, absolutely, absolutely nothing. So uh, you and Neil Barnden decided to team together and form this new company. Yep. Um, how was it forming the company and how was that kind of transition into the, the, the 3D world with all the kind of rendered environments and textures and stuff? Yeah, well, I had to do, I, I felt, I've been working freelance, so by that time I was um, 31. I've been working freelance since I, before I went to uni, since I was 17. And you sort of feel, well, hang on a minute, I'm always waiting for the next contract to come through. What are you going to do? You're not building anything, you're not actually... Uh, three years later, where are you going to be? Just waiting for the next thing. So I wanted to actually create something, build something, uh, and it was natural to do it with, with Mill. So, and that was happened to be at the same time as 3D was coming in. So um, we actually had our own engine at that stage. It took us um, so long. This guy that um, his name now, guy that had a, a, a published game for casting ring on the Mac as well. He wrote his own 3D Raven engine. By the time we got the game funded with SCI for a whole year, he got off and got a job somewhere else and we were left without any engine. But you know, we, we looked at um, all the latest stuff, Rengerware um, at the time, when the Morphics became DirectX and um, Grendel, or b Rengerware, which is the Ardenort system. So in my, I've got a very solid mass background, mass physics background anyway, so I didn't find it particularly difficult to move into that. And, I mean, at that stage, you, you couldn't really get away with releasing 2D games around the mid-'90s, could you? Everything had to be 3D no. all of a sudden. No, we couldn't. Well, we, we did this demo uh, using our own engine um, in 94, um, early 94, actually, one of the first people... Well, that came about, actually, from talking to Carl Jeffries, who owns Climax, who was just over the water from us. Um, I went over there and chatted with him. It was really helpful. He said, yeah... Hopefully, I'm going to set up a company and stuff. And he said, mate, what you've just got to go and do a demo. Go and do a demo, and then you might get it somewhere. Otherwise, you'll just talk in hot air. So we did this demo, which was really ahead of its time. It's 3D Destruction Derby, we call it, demo. Using 3D, using proper physics, proper car physics, and proper just damage physics as well. We showed that around to people. And the demo, uh, because it was 3D and proper physics that early, got a lot of people take notice of us, but as I said, it was, the, as they saw it, the lack of any sort of experience and heritage really made it difficult to get signed up, despite the fact that what we were doing was, was you know, ahead of the curve. So how did this kind of 3D Destruction Derby title turn into Carmageddon with all the sick machines and the uh, really cool little video in the corner and everything? Yeah, the video in the corner was there on the original demo. So um, my, my hobby at the time was banger racing, so every um, other Sunday during the summer, I smashed up cars for fun. I had whiplash for the rest of the week. Um, got lobby into it a bit as well. So he, he, he raced a few times, and not quite as obsessively as me. But it sort of came about from the game came about from me always turning around in racing games, getting bored by racing games, whether it was Ridge Racer or Daytona or whatever, and trying my hardest to hit the cars coming the other way. <laughs> and then thinking, why don't we make a game out of this? Why don't we make a game where the idea is to hit the cars coming the other way? So the game came about from those two things. A, it was my hobby anyway, for real. Um, and B, it was that. Let's make a game where you're meant to disrupt the race. You're meant to do the thing you're not meant to do, if you like. And having that um, driver's but, face is such a good kind of reaction to see when the driver's yeah. hitting something. <laughs> it's, you know. Yeah, the frat can, yeah. That was great fun. We've got footage, raw footage somewhere of the actual footage of doing that, um, where we're actually hitting Tony, who's a nutter. Um, <laughs> we're smacking him around the head, the back of the head with a pull cue to get the whiplash effect. And we're going, go on, go on, hit me harder. Um, there's also, the re and there's, Video footage of this, this is on YouTube, if you look it up somewhere, 
they footage of him going through the windscreen and my big old yank had a Chevy Caprice. We went out to get um uh, some footage for yeah, reference and what does it look like? The artist wanted to see what does it look like when you run someone over? So we went out to the local car park, you know, opposite the office and repeatedly rang him over. And he actually went to the windscreen at one station. That is on video. It's on, it's on the internet <laughs> out there somewhere. We'll put it um, in our show notes. The, yeah, someone called the police eventually and said, there's someone being run over in the car park. <laughs> so they came to check us out. So. <laughs> yeah, but that took some explaining, did it? <laughs> it did, yeah. But the video camera on the tripod, the guy sort of stood there going, I don't mind, yeah. Go on, hit me harder. <laughs> yeah, it, it became calm again because what, SEI were very much a licensed-based publisher, obviously. Uh, hence, Norm Merman uh, and all those games that you previously, they were very much around licenses. So they, what, they said, yeah, this is great, we'll do it. And they actually took a punch on, on us, which was um, you know, very appreciated, and still is to this day, because no one else would trust us. Um, so they took they said, yeah, they will do it, we'll fund it. But they originally put Mad Max license on it, so the game was actually going to be a Mad Max license. Oh, wow. They couldn't find the rights holders, though, back then. Couldn't find who owned it. Um, it was very vague what the ownership was. So they gave up on that. It was then Death Race, because there was going to be a new Death Race uh, film called Death Race 2020. And the the Etsy of Carmageddon was called Death Race without an A, um, because it had the eight characters, right until we shipped it. It was still called Death Race dot Etsy. Um, so the, the running people over on it got um, put in there because it was going to be Death Race. That was why that ended up got put in there. That was purely because of the license. And they were reasonably early in development. They couldn't get that. Then the film wasn't happening. Roger Corman, I don't know what happened, but they, the film never happened anyway, so the license never happened. Um, and SCI went, right, sorry, let's just do it anyway. Um, we won't license it. The game looks like it can stand up on its own. Um, or rather, be run over on its own, I guess. <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> they... So that's what, yeah, so that's what happened. They went, yeah, okay, that's more thing for the name, which Nobby came up with the time again name. So, yeah, so that's, that's just sort of the, where it came from. But I think it, the, the fact that running people over wasn't, wasn't originally part of the game is why it's a good game as well, because there was a core game in there all along. Some people, we, we were often accused, and still are, of um, only getting sales because of the controversy value of it. And our argument to that is, well, actually, they weren't even in there in the first place. Um, and there was long in there a, a switch in the code where you could either lose points or gain points uh, for hitting them. We still weren't sure right up until the end whether we could even get away with it. So well, it was actually an avoiding game at one stage. You decided to go to the BBFC um, to get a game rating. Um, kind of volu- voluntary, yeah, exactly. wasn't it? Or- it was complicated. It was, it was voluntary, but I think, obviously, this is more SCI than us. We were exposed to it all very much, but SCI were the ones who did it directly. Um, it looked like it was going to have trouble, um, so they thought, OK, best bet is to get it rated. Um, that way we'll avoid the trouble because we'll have a rating. Um, and it backfired on them because they refused to rate it and they banned it. So it was the only, only game ever to banned. It was the first product we banned, I think, since Driller Killer, the, Infamous video, video that actually coins the term video nasty. Yeah. It sent the uh, coolness ratings for me and my mates through the roof when that got <laughs> banned. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite scary at the time that the office got radio at SCI. We were never radio, but we were, um, everybody asked uh, during this was told, don't answer the phone if they're, you know, to press call, if they call around your house and all that sort of thing, um, just refer them to SCI. We didn't really get too much of that. Oh, wow. it. So it got, yeah, it got quite, you know, quite nasty. All good publicity, but I think from for SCI as well, it's very, very stressful because they were personally liable um, for this. So uh, it was more stressful for them than us. Actually, we thought it was hilarious. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the, the game did get banned in some countries outright, didn't it? And I know it was censored in in Germany and the UK. I mean, did you have to oh, make yeah, changes it was, originally? Yeah, it was censored in the UK. Uh, we had we did various things. There was a disc. Um, that, that you could um, put in the drive when you played the game, uh, and it would then crack it, basically. And we obviously denied all knowledge. No idea how that disc ever got out there um, to, that would give it red blood. So we had to put the green blood in here at last minute. But uh, when they when they overturned the BBFC's rating, then the red blood was then you know, switched back on, yeah, so permanently. 
it was bang, yeah, bang in Germany, but everything is bang in Germany, it's, um, it still is. Um, we were banged in, bang in France, we were banged in Australia, Australia was very strict. The funniest one was Brazil, we were banged at the end of the week. So at the start of the week, they said, this game is going to be banged at the end of the week. So of course our cells are fantastic that week. They should have gone buy it. <laughs> Rush out and get it while you can, yeah. W.H. Smith banged, it, banged the demo disc. Um, for the cover mount, I can't remember what magazine it was, it might be PC Zone. And they said, we're not, we're not carrying that, there's no way we're not going to carry that. Um, until it went to number one. So when it came out, it was new entry at number one on the all formats chart. And W.H. Smith immediately went, OK, maybe we will carry it. Let them carry it then. <laughs> so as soon as they realised they were losing sales of magazines, they started carrying it. Well, how well received were the console ports? The original, see, our original contract with SCI was to do PC, uh, PlayStation and Saturn. Mm. It soon became clear that Saturn was no point. Um, so uh, the PlayStation, though, we ended up subcontracting that. That was a, uh, it was a basket child of a game, really, because it went through, I think, at least four developers, each one failing. So we just couldn't get it done at the same time. There were only eight of us um, at the same time as PC. Uh, so they subcontracted it. Oh, we're aware now. But they then subcontracted it again after taking that, that company to court. They then subcontracted it again. Every time it fell because the PlayStation hardware just wasn't up to it. Um, and they eventually took it internally uh, to their studio. Um, and they did actually a really good job of it. Um, to, uh, people like John Court, Steve Haggerty, who's still on the island, did, um, I know very well still, did a great job on, um, on porting eventually a job that three companies couldn't do. Uh, but the hardware really wasn't up to the, to the physics, so it was never it was never the game it should have been. The Nintendo 64 version is known as one of the worst games ever made. Uh, because, again, the, the hardware just couldn't do it. It just couldn't do it at all, but um, SCI wanted to get out on lots of platforms, so they put it out anyway. But the, the eventual PlayStation version was, a, um, was quite a reasonable game in the end, but uh, had such a difficult birth. Even space limitations on the N64 cartridges, I bet, made it difficult. Oh, it's impossible. They should never have done it. It shouldn't have been done. It was really silly. They should have just done a technical evaluation and gone, this is not going to work. I'm not done it. Well, the um, Splat Pack came out in 1997. Did that add anything? A little bit. So we had to pause development of Carmageddon 2 because um, the Carmageddon 1 just sold so well. They said, OK, we'll delay Carmageddon 2 by three months and quickly put out what you, you'd now call DLC. Um, we did had a few rendering features. It had transparency in it, um, which we didn't have on Karma 1. Uh, and it had support for hardware graphics. Because Karma 1 was all software rendering, as it was at the time. And just when we came out, hardware graphics cards, like 3DFX, were just starting to come out. So Splatpak added um, support for hardware graphics and for, um, and for transparency. Um, so you have things like glass and things like that. Uh, but uh, no other actual features. Well, let's talk about the second game then. What were kind of the aims of Carmageddon 2 Carpocalypse now then? What did you want to add to that game and improve on the original? Basically, everything we not managed to fit into the first one, we went, right, let's do it now, uh, which isn't really the best approach to, um, to game design. <laughs> um, so we, just, we tried to do everything, and we did. We did actually ship that game on time. The fact that it was uh, delivered to Goldmaster two weeks ahead of time to SCI on that, uh, but that's the hardest I've ever worked. I had young kids at the time, um, and I didn't see them for like four or five months at the end of that game. We were all working till gone dawn, so we were going home at like 8, 9 a.m., and we said never again after that. So the, so that game was designed basically by let's do everything we possibly can, and the hours were just, just ridiculous, even by video game development standards. Those hours were crazy. Um, and you could argue that the game... Um, wasn't as pure as Karma 1. It had some great things, technically fantastic things in it. But I think the, um, in a way, Karma Game 1 was a, a, a purer, more visceral experience in certain ways. So I often read that people you know, people often regard the first game as more fun. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. Look, I think we're really layering in the, uh, the features on the second one without maybe taking uh, you know, enough of a step backwards. I mean, is that why you decided to make it a PC exclusive then, just because it was so technically advanced? I was saying there's no way it was on the console. Yeah. Both games on the Mac, though, as well. And as I said, they, um, they were actually developed almost entirely on the Mac, Karma 1 and Karma 2. They were actually ported to PC, 
the reason being the um, development environment was so much better on the back. The debugger on um, Code Warrior was so much better than the APC debugger. So we'd actually develop the game on the Mac and really just do a PC build just to ship it. So there were Mac versions on as well, but uh, yeah, there's, there's no consoles taken behind in that at all. So what happened with the third game then? Because I read that you weren't involved in TDR 2000. Oh, <laughs> Well, a lot of bitter stories in the video games industry. So they, um, Norman and I went up for a, uh, a meeting at um, uh, SCI after Karma 2 ship, and down. they went, right, off we go then, let's do Karma Level 3. And they went, whoa, 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 hang on. So we just come off this crazy, crazy, um, I don't know how many hours a week, yeah, 80 to 100, it really was, seven days a week, yeah, grab a few hours sleep, it's like Apollo program level of working. Yeah. We were, um, so we went, no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. we just come straight off it. Um, and creatively, we'd rather do something else. Don't want to go straight into the third one. I haven't done nothing but Karma Gaming for, by that time, basically four years, doing the demo. And then, oh, okay, fair enough. Three or four months later, we read in um, CTW, the trade press, that Karma Gaming 3 was coming out, um, written by Taurus in Australia. That's the first thing we knew about it, was reading it in the press. What they never said to us was, are you sure you don't want to do it? Because otherwise we'll give it to someone else. Because then we'll have gone, oh, okay, then, yeah, maybe we will. But no, they took our, our um, no, hang on a minute, no, we want to do something else as a, a, a blanket refusal. So that hurt. Yeah, that was, and it was a rubbish game. There's a few strange people out there that like it, but by and large, we distance ourselves very much from it. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it got some dreadful reviews, didn't it? It's awful. It's just, it's, you, couldn't, you needed the original developers. So a game like Karma Game well, it's all about the twisted brains of myself and Nobby. And you try and, um, yeah, you try and get someone else to interpret it. I guess I kept doing um, for many years afterwards. Well, you can't, you know, certain games. It's like imagine someone else did Half Life rather than Valve. Yeah. Uh, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, you, know, you can't, it doesn't work sometimes. When a, when a game is a, a proper representation of its creators, in the same as a film, it's no different if, if you look at, um, you know, later Dunnators or you know, Robocops or whatever, you know, it needs the original creator involved to make a, a creative product uh, properly valid. If somebody else tries to take it over, it's usually a pale shadow. So um, TDR 2000 is you know, just one example of a huge list of, of things like that. Well, I mean, Car- Carmageddon, the first two games had like, you know, had your, your sense of humour in there and your personalities in the game as well, which, you know, we're all missing yeah. in the third one. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, talking of a game of with a good sense of humour, State of Emergency is a fantastic yeah. <laughs> little title. I really love that. Um, were you reading lots of, like, Judge Dredd and stuff at the time? Or? <laughs> <laughs> this was developing that for years. It was a game that started out as a riot simulator, um, a much more um, sort of top-down simulation game um, designed by Kirk Ewing. Um, and the game was really going nowhere. Um, they had it, the game didn't know what it was, if you like. So I was parachuted in as executive director on that, with complete freedom to redesign, change the team around, do whatever I want, and basically get the game turned around and shipping. Um, so I just took a look at the whole thing, um, wrote up what worked, what didn't work, everywhere, anything that didn't work, and gave them you know, reason to make it work. But we only had like six months really to always start from scratch. Um, so within that remit, it was a good game. But it was a great it, it, uh, budget yeah. title as well. It was really. Yeah, that's what it was in the end because it was. Even though I'd been going for years, almost everything was thrown away. So it was to, to, for me coming into shipping was probably about nine months. And it was almost starting from scratch in that. So there were so many design decisions that basically had to go. No, that's not going to fit. It's not going to ship. You were already been so late. Um, but it was number one both sides of the Atlantic. It was, it was a fun little game. Well, speaking of more, you know, scale-back titles that weren't maybe as technically advanced, you actually had a project of bringing back some classic Atari titles to Xbox Live Arcade. Yes, yeah, that's right. that was a joy for me because um, I played all those um, all those games at university. And um, my background, more as a background, as a hobbyist, was hardware anyway. I play with hardware since I was 13, 12, 13, the only reason I really got into programming properly was I couldn't afford to buy um, chips, or buy the, the hardware or pocket money. Um, so being able to then take 
the circuit diagrams of games that I adored as a teenager and to, um, to create a proper emulation of those was a, a dream come true for me. That was fantastic work. I enjoy that so much. Well, how did you go about converting those, you know, old games that were made for like a single button joystick, most of them for, or trackballs, you know, to, to the Xbox hardware and controller? All but two of them were truly emulated. Um, so they were actually were running the ROMs, were running the hardware. And what I then did is look through all the assembler of them, fortunately it's 6502, which is what I use for the Apple II, so I can think 6502, worked out how they were working and got hooks in there to, um, to make basically the Xbox then do completely different things and raise the achievements and change the graphics and everything. But even the really updated versions of those games uh, were still running the original code. It was just I was hooking in and sort of watching what it was doing and reacting to it. So it was quite an odd way of doing things. We didn't do that with the Battle Zone. Um, Battle Zone Warlords and I think Missile Command evolved. We didn't do that with. We thought, no, we need to. It would restrict us a bit too much. The Warlords and Battle Zone, they had to be multiplayer. Um, so the, the evolved versions of those were written from scratch. Did you manage to meet or collaborate with any of the original designers? Barely. I, I got a very quick um, email um, exchange of Al Alcorn, um, who wrote Asteroids, who is now doing something or other. I can't remember what it was, but he didn't seem that interested, actually, and they've moved on. And all the rest of them, Atari had no idea how to contact anyone who they were. So it was only Al Alcorn, and, which I thought was going to be great, but nothing I guess Atari, Atari had been through about four different companies by that stage, I guess. Oh, exactly, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, didn't, they didn't have a clue who did, who did what. So um, Centipede was the first um, uh, commercial game written by a woman, actually. Right. Um, so Centipede and Millipede, yeah, I can't remember her name. But, um, yeah, that was the first one. But I think these were back when, you know, like when I, my first game was a one-person game. So, yeah, they, they lost to those contacts. It was great doing it. Well... Throughout this whole time, there was still a huge Carmageddon fan community, and they were still alive. So, yeah, they were alive, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you decided to do a remake. How hard was it to get the rights back for Carmageddon? No, we were trying for years. I mean, there were, I want to say there were 200 um, fan sites out there for Carmageddon. But even when it got to the early, two, um, early 2010s, um, there were still... Still loads of fan sites out there. Were still people modifying the game, even then, like 15 years later. We talked to SCI quite a lot about doing more work. We were about to do another version of Carmageddon with them when they reversed into IDOS um, and suddenly had far bigger fish to fry. So all of a sudden they owned Tomb Raider. Um, so that all just sort of fizzled. So nothing was really going to happen um, with it, but they were never going to sell us the rights. Then um, when Square Enix um, bought IDOS, you know, which were then SCI, mm. we asked them really just for the, you know, well, why not? You might as well ask, assuming that they would never want to sell. Um, and they very surprisingly, they, they were willing to sell it. They just bought this company, had all these sort of, you know, IP in the vault. There was never something that Square Enix was ever going to use. But it still surprised us that um, they sold us the rights. Very much so. We've been trying for so many years, and we thought, well, it's really gone now. Now Square have got it. But it's quite the opposite. They were, they were brilliant. They, yes, we got it lost, struck, and barrel. Ironically enough, we own um, TGR 2000 as well. It was, it's all of Carmageddon. So even the game that... Um, I'm not sure how, well, how much I can swear on this podcast. Anyway, those charming <laughs> uh, people did. Um, so, yeah, we ended up owning that even. <laughs> There's no, no plans to remake that, though? No? <laughs> no, no. Well, if you think about remaking it and then not releasing it to anyone, you're burning every copy of it. <laughs> 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 I mean, what was kind of the, you know, when you announced that you're going to be doing like an updated version of Carmageddon, what was the reaction like then? Well, the reaction was really good. It's, um, a lot of people still love the game, so they're really pleased to see it back. Um, obviously, the Kickstarter campaign, uh, we just hit the Kickstarter downward curve. So we still, you know, we made our target, made good money um, on, on that. A tiny fraction of the development budget, as we said, really, you know, 10% probably less the development budget but it was great what it did do is it showed that how many people 
um, like the idea of it coming back. It's all very well and good people saying they like it and saying they like the idea of it coming back, but the money where their mouth is on a Kickstarter campaign is is different. That means that um, you know, they've actually done they really do want it. So we, the Kickstarter campaign was the thing that validated that fact that people did want it. So it, it took two years to go from beta to full release, and I remember seeing different reviews of it at different points in the beta. And then later on, an update came out, and then I started seeing crazy good reviews for it. So yeah, we, we were so we, we really learned the hard way what it is to come um, to try and self-publish. In fact, we had no support on that. We did it entirely ourselves. Um, we didn't have any support from the publishers. Um, so we were pressurised. Obviously, we had investors. Um, that had put money into it on the back of, as I said, the Kickstarter stuff. So you're pressurising to release it, and we haven't got the funds to do a Valve or a Big or all those companies that can just go, yeah, we'll release it when it's ready. Or well, we can't do that because we've got people clamouring after uh, getting their money back. Um, so you end up um, with a gun to your head and being forced to release it too early. Um, and that's, that's what we've had to do. So it got a bad backlash because there were, it was buggy, and in particular, the frame rate was bad, because it's all our own engine. Every single part of that code there is all our, our own. So um, it, it did take a long time to then keep on working, keep on working at it, really self-funded. There's a lot of money um, went into that. All our royalties uh, from doing um, all the Magic the Gathering work um, that we did for Wizards, you know, that sold well, and um, Wizards of the Coast is a really good company to work for. Um, so we've got good royalties for that. Um, and I've still got a gigantic mortgage because rather than take the royalties out, <laughs> we ploughed it all into Karma Games to keep it, you know, to get it out there. Well, but, you know, it's a good game in the end. Well, that, yeah, that's the thing. A lot of these games, you know, they'll, they'll initially release and then... Um people will go, oh, that's that's not amazingly good. And then they'll disappear into obscurity. The thing is, you updated and everyone turned around and then said, yeah. take a relook at this. This is a fantastic remake. So. Yeah, well, we, the thing is, we believe to be it. I think it's a kind of reincarnation and kind of much damage, which was a sort of PC version of the console version. So a lot of stuff added. Um, it's a very, very good game. So we believed in the game. We believed it's a really good game. Um, the problem we had with it, though, was exposure. So it, we we just we have no marketing budget. Now, I still meet people to this day that say, "Oh, come again!" And I love that. I have no idea there's a new version of it out there. I know with Max Damage, I saw, you know, there were some reviews in, like, the Metro and the Mirror that weren't very flattering to yeah. it. Um, but I think, do you think that was a case of, like, the mainstream gaming press today struggling to understand it a bit? Because, I mean, I know the fans loved it, but they were saying it's like, it felt retro, which I imagine was probably part of the appeal, you know, to original fans. It was, yeah. I mean, the particular console version, see, that goes back to something we talked about much earlier, is we felt that now the consoles have finally caught up. Um, with Carmageddon. The consoles could now do the things you need to do in Carmageddon. We were wrong uh, because it was incredibly difficult to get the uh, PS4 <laughs> and Xbox to work with that um, uh, the code that worked in a PC. It was really, really difficult actually, but we did manage it. Um, so it was, something always felt to us like it was a console game. It's a very arcadey, fun, bright, exciting sort of game. It always felt that console was its natural home so we felt this new version, it was like a come full circle. Finally, it could be on its, you know, into its, its natural home. But it was a retro title. Yeah, things, again, have moved on a little bit. Not, I'm not dissimilar to what I said earlier about Sky Shadow, uh, my, you know, my original Apple II 1982 hardcore beat em up, not, no, sorry, um, shoot em up, not being right for 1990 on the Mac. A very free form. Um, 1997 game coming out now on consoles is something with some, some of the problem because we didn't know what to do with it. But the, the, the final part of the game, as I'm sure you know, is that you, go, you can do what you want. Off you go. Just have fun. You don't need to do what you, what, you know, the game isn't telling you what to do. You can go and do what you want. Play it how you want. And that, that isn't trending. Now, games more and more uh, hold your hand all the way through. So I think some of the also, you know, um, contemporary reviewers now, uh, they didn't get it. They didn't get what is, a, you know, what is the freedom of this game. You know, mm -hmm. If you don't understand that, uh, and you, you can get lost very quickly as to what the game is all about. And you can very quickly dislike it. Well, I've heard um, 
And I've actually seen pictures of you having a bigger Carmageddon car yourself. And I was wondering if you drive around the Isle of Wight scaring people with it. <laughs> we have actually got that, yeah. We, yeah, the, what, the rat rod. Well, we have a few, actually. But, yeah, the rat rod, uh, which I've built in the States, that is actually in a lock-up over here, actually. It's in cows. So, no, it wouldn't be very road legal, but um, <laughs> we drove it from L.A., actually. So and my wife had to drive it from L.A. We lacked was a gay ass we landed, so we're really jet-lagged. Picked it up from the hot rod shop in L.A., um, she's only driven in the States a couple of times on the wrong side of the road. She had to drive this thing because she was the only one small enough to fit in it. Right through downtown LA traffic with no brakes. The brakes didn't <laughs> it. Big blades sticking out of it. And, uh, so um, with me behind her in a hire car and Jason Garber, our function director in front of her. So we're sort of guarding her either side. So that has been driven through public roads right through downtown LA, I think. <laughs> I bet it's a good way to get through traffic jams. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of people looking, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, do you uh, consider bringing back any other IPs, like older ones, you know, Liberator or anything like that? <laughs> I still, uh, Crystal Quest, funny enough, uh, only this week I renewed a trademark um, on Crystal Quest. I own Crystal Quest personally, um, so I license that. Yeah, two stones. I've kept all that myself. Um, so, yeah, I renewed it for another 10 years. I'd love to. I think there's still a lot of um, there's a lot of love for that game. So many people really, really love Crystal Quest. Uh, it was ubiquitous. Um, most people copied it, didn't pay for it, uh, but it was uh, it was on every Macintosh for about four years. Mm. So um, yeah, I'd love to yeah do something um, particular Crystal Quest and do something. There's, there's, there's still scope for that for doing something with it. And for Calm Again, we're still we we released Calm Again Crashes. So, free to play um, game on Android and iOS uh, recently. So, yeah, we're still working with Karma. There's something else we're doing at the moment, prototyping for Karma Game. So Karma Game will still be doing things with uh, moving into the future. I think Crystal Quest has still got, it's still got legs in it. <laughs> I thought uh, Karma Get in VR, where you have to dodge cars coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> could be interesting. That would be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that would be an underwear changer. Well, Patrick, if people want to keep up to date with you, um, well, where can they find you? You've got a website, social media, do you do all that? I know, if I started doing, um, doing Twitter, I'd never put my phone down. That's trouble. So. <laughs> we know um, the feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm purposely avoiding Twitter. I mean, strangersgames.com, carmageddon.com, yeah, it shows what we're doing, basically, so it's all up there. Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming on this week, Patrick. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It's been an honour.